Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of W102. So first of all, we have the homework six that is due this Friday. No questions asked extension until Sunday. Uh, today is Wednesday evening. I just finished my office hours today. And so I will send out the meeting minutes shortly after recording this lecture. All right, today is a very exciting lecture. We're gonna cover some new topics, uh, mostly centered around sampling. And the motivation for this is, in reality, we can never really store a continuous time signal, right? There are infinitely many time points uh, on the plot on the left. And so what we can do instead is we can sample the signal at discrete time points. For example, we could sample the signal at some you know, time point here. I'll draw it in blue. I could take this time point here, whatever this timestamp is on the horizontal axis and record this y kind of um, value that the function takes at this x value. So for example, if this is something like five, I would record a five here for something like minus three. Now I might take another sample. Let's say I take this six seconds later and I can have another sample here and I would record whatever this value is, which might be something like seven. And so in this particular case, I have a sampling period. This is the spacing between samples that I've taken of units T. Now it's possible to sample the signal in a finer way. I don't need to sample six seconds apart. I can sample uh, very finely. For example, here I'll take a whole bunch of samples in red. And here I might have a smaller sampling period So the key here is that you can sample signals and you can space them apart with a sampling period called capital T. And this is related to discrete signals. Now, mathematically, when we try to sample a continuous signal, we have fortunately an expression for this. Uh, earlier in the class, we discussed how a function f of t can be multiplied by the delta function. So if I take f of t and I multiply it by the delta function, then what I'm really doing is I'm actually sampling the value of zero here, okay? And that's because delta of t is non-zero only for f of zero, so I don't need to consider the rest of f of t. I can localize or sample f of t to f of zero. And in general, I can do this for any delay tau, right? So if I have some function f of t that gets multiplied by a delayed version of a delta function, then this is like sampling the function at f of tau uh, So in this lecture, we're going to formalize this intuition of using a delta function to sample signals. Uh, our first goal will be to study uh, the Fourier transform of a periodic signal. Previously in the class, we discussed the Fourier transform of an aperiodic signal, and today we'll discuss the Fourier transform of a periodic signal. So let's begin. Uh, let's say I give you a periodic signal and I ask you to take its Fourier transform. Now, there's a problem here. Uh, the problem, if you recall from about two or three lectures ago, we discussed one of the conditions for the Fourier transform to exist. We said pretty much the Fourier transform is always gonna exist for a signal, except if the signal does not have bounded energy, right? If the signal is not, uh, you know, does not have, is not absolutely integrable, right? So for example, if I have some signal f of t dt and this, uh, adds up to essentially infinity, right? If it, if it cannot be bounded like this, if this does not hold, so this is not less than some constant b, then I cannot take the signals for your transform. Now, it turns out that f of t, if f of t is periodic, it's not gonna be bounded because overall t, it's, it's gonna, the absolute value will add up to infinity. And so therefore, we need to use a trick here. And the trick is this. Let's say I have a periodic f of t. Well, instead of directly taking the Fourier transform, I'm gonna indirectly take the Fourier transform. I'm gonna first convert f of t into its Fourier series representation. And this is perfectly allowed because f of t is periodic. 
So now I take f of t, I convert it to its Fourier series representation. And so this is just the Fourier series equations from before. So Fourier series, Fourier series. So I have the Fourier series equations and I have the Fourier series coefficient equations, all right? Now, if I look at the Fourier series equation, just as a side note right here, if you look, this equation over here is very similar to the Fourier transform, right? It's got e to the j omega t, but here it's j k omega naught t, and you also have a summation rather than an integral. So please just keep that in mind, file that away, that the Fourier series representation is pretty close to the Fourier transform. Now, what we can do is let's hypothetically say I have the Fourier series. So remember f of t is periodic. So it's, it, you know, it's an element of the periodic set, let's say. It's periodic. So it's not possible to do a direct Fourier transform. However, what I can do is I can take f of t, then compute the Fourier series, and then do a Fourier transform on the Fourier series. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So here's um, on the left hand side in this equation, I want to ideally take the Fourier transform of f of t, but I cannot do that. I cannot do it directly because it's periodic. Therefore, what I do is I go ahead and I convert f of t using the Fourier series representation written down here. Now I try to take the Fourier transform of this guy. So let's actually just go and plug and chug this. If I want to take the Fourier transform of the Fourier series representation, what can I do here? Well, first of all, I can simplify this equation because the Fourier transform is linear. Since the Fourier transform is linear, I have the summation over k of ck times the Fourier operator of e to the jk omega naught t. Right, I can pop the Fourier operator inside because the Fourier operator is linear. Now, let's take a look at how we can simplify this. If I just stare at this equation, uh, I look at it for a little bit, I realize, whoa, we know what the Fourier transform of the complex exponential is, right? We know that the Fourier transform of the complex exponential from the beginning of last lecture, it, it's a very difficult integral, right? It's a very difficult integral transform, but we did derive it in the last lecture as being two pi times a delta. So now we can simplify this further as ck two pi delta omega minus k omega naught. So if it's not clear how we got from this step to this step, please look at the first slide of the last lecture. So the take home message here is that the Fourier transform all the periodic signal is the Fourier series coefficients CK multiplied by two pi times an impulse. So now let's graphically take a look at this. On the left-hand side, I have my Fourier series representation. Remember, this Fourier series representation is a proxy for f of t. So f of t equals this. Now I'm gonna take a Fourier transform of this. And we're saying that the Fourier transform of this is now a proxy for capital F of j omega, which is the Fourier transform I wanted to take previously. So let's take a look at how this, this appears on a graph. In green here, you see the Fourier series representation of some signal. So this is the Fourier series representation of a signal. Remember it's discrete because every sample is spaced apart by k omega naught. Now we're gonna take the Fourier transform here of this green signal, we're gonna take the Fourier transform. And when I take the Fourier transform, effectively what I'm doing here is I'm putting Dirac's uh, at the Fourier series coefficient locations. So these Dirac's are scaled. So for example, this height here is gonna be two pi 
c sub zero, right? It's scaled by two pi. This is gonna be two pi c sub one. This is gonna be two pi c sub two. Okay. Where in this particular figure, this is c sub zero, c sub one, c sub two. So what I've done here is I've scaled the Fourier series coefficients by two pi times a delta. It might help to look at a concrete example. Let's say, returning to our premise of the lecture, that we wanted to take a Fourier transform of a periodic signal. That was our goal, right? So what's an example? Let's look at a square wave. A square wave is a periodic sequence of recs. So if I look at the period here, I can just visually look. The period is from tip to tip, right? Edge to edge. So from here to here is so minus 0.5 to 1.5, that is two seconds. So the period here is two seconds. So in this particular case, t equals two. So let's draw it out. I can go from here to here, okay? So that's one period. And in this particular case, if t equals two, remember that omega naught equals two pi over t, so therefore omega naught equals pi, right? That's the fundamental frequency. So this is an example of a periodic signal, and let's say I ask you to compute the Fourier transform. Now, you cannot just go and magically do a Fourier transform on this equation. If you try to do that, you'll see that it's unbounded and the integral doesn't converge. So what we have to do is we have to appeal to our notion of the Fourier series representation. Now, these slide numbers might not exactly match, so please check these slide numbers. But in the Fourier series lecture, we calculated that the Fourier series of the rect function was CK times equals one half times the sink of K over two. All right, so these are the Fourier series coefficients. So if I have CK, I can compute the Fourier transform. Remember that the Fourier transform shown in red here, this Fourier transform in red is nothing but two pi delta times the Fourier series coefficients. Okay, so if I have this information, then what I can do is I can write out explicitly capital F of J omega, that was our goal. It's gonna equal, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with what's un underlined in red. It's gonna equal the sum uh, over infinity, I'm just gonna shorthand that as k, one half sink k over two times two pi times the delta of omega minus k omega naught. Now this is gonna equal the sum over k of pi sink omega over two pi, delta of omega minus k pi. <clears throat> and so this equation here follows because of these facts. Remember that t equals two, omega naught equals pi, therefore delta of omega minus k omega naught actually simplifies to delta of omega minus k pi. Okay, so that explains how we got <clears throat> from this line to this line. Okay. So uh, let's just stare at it for a moment, this equation right here. This is my Fourier transform. I'm gonna box it so that we just see it more clearly. It's basically a sink function that is being multiplied <clears throat> by a delta, uh, but really it's being multiplied by a summation of deltas, right? The sink function is not in the limit of k, so I could remove that out of the summation. And really I'm taking pi sink times a summation of deltas that are all shifted. This is gonna become important later in the lecture, so just keep that in mind. So here's that equation again that's magnified. I've brought the pi out. So I've got the summation of sinks 
uh, that are all being multiplied by a delta. And what this looks like, since the sink is not repeated k times, because it's not you know, effectively in the summation, it could have been placed outside. What it really is, is it's the sink function, our standard familiar sink function, which is shown in black, right? Our standard familiar sink function, and this is being multiplied by the sequence of deltas. Now, it turns out that this sequence of deltas is a sp special function. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add another function to our catalog. And that function we're going to add is something called the impulse train. So the impulse train, which is very similar to the sampling function, is basically a bunch of delta functions that are spaced apart by t units, capital T units. So you know, you, I have some sort of axis here. I have the time domain. I have a delta here, then I have another delta here at, at time t, I have another delta here at 2t, and so on. And here it goes to minus t, minus 2t, and so on. So that's my standard impulse train. Here's another illustration drawn a little bit more officially. So here I have a plot, I have this delta impulse train. Now, if we look at the Fourier transform of the square wave. The Fourier transform of the square wave was pi sinc omega over 2 pi times that shifted version of deltas. We're going to use this special shorthand here, uh, delta subscript pi of omega. And delta subscript pi of omega is a shorthand for uh, essentially that is represented here, where pi here is uh, capital T, which is the period. So it's spaced apart by omega units. Okay, so we're just applying this definition here in the substitution of that previous equation for the Fourier transform of the square wave. All right. So to some of you, the impulse train may have been the first thing you were thinking about when you were considering how to sample a signal every t units, t seconds. Um, so let me start with a question here, and this will be a check your understanding question on the next slide. Intuitively, what is the Fourier transform of the impulse train? So here it is. As a check your understanding, I'm going to ask you to tell me what the Fourier transform of the impulse train is. The impulse train is periodic, so we're going to have to apply that similar idea that we did for the square wave. We're going to have to understand the Fourier transform of a periodic signal. But before crunching to, through any math, uh, this is an unofficial check your understanding question, meaning it's a guess check your understanding. So just pause the video and guess in your head. Just run through a few different options. What could the Fourier transform of an impulse train be? Okay, so just hazard a guess, pause the video, and then rejoin us in a few seconds. All right, welcome back. So we're actually going to go through this because it's not easy to calculate the impulse train. The answer is intuitive, but there's some calculations we need to do if we're going to do this the official way. So first, uh, remember that the impulse train is periodic. So we're going to have to apply a similar strategy as we did for the square wave example. Remember that uh, when we were doing the square wave example, we know that the Fourier transform of the square wave is a sink multiplied by the delta, right? The, the impulse train, uh, delta sub pi. So by this definition, then let me just write this here. The Fourier transform, let's write it in notation. So the Fourier transform of square wave is going to be equal to sinc times delta of pi of omega. Now, just recapping from the previous sections, if this is true, then I can actually apply what we learned about convolution theorem to this. With the convolution theorem, we know that this is a multiplication. This is a times, right? Or I'll write it as a cross. Uh, this is a multiplication. So multiplication in time is 
what in, in, in the dual domain. So in the, the dual domain of the Fourier transform is going to be square wave, right? So this is the dual of the Fourier domain is the time domain. So it's a regular square wave. So square wave is the dual domain. And here I'm going to have the Fourier transform of sync. Convolved with whatever is the dual. It's really going to be the inverse Fourier transform, right? Because we're going from uh, frequency to time. So it's going to be the inverse Fourier transform of the impulse train, right? Now, what is the inverse Fourier transform of uh, sync? Well, that's nothing but a rect. So I can just go and replace this with a rect. So it's going to be the square wave is going to be equal in the last example to a rect convolved with the Fourier transform of the impulse train. In the next few slides, we're actually going to solve for what the Fourier inverse Fourier transform of the impulse train is. But let's look at this equation intuitively. What it's telling me is that in the primal domain, which is the time domain, the square wave is the rect convolved with the Fourier transform of the impulse train. Now, if I think about it intuitively, the square wave is a rect, right? Every periodic unit of the square wave is a rect function. Okay. So every unit, periodic unit of the square wave is a rect. And therefore, it's if I have one rect in the expression, it's going to be one rect convolved with an impulse train. So intuitively, the square wave is a rect convolved with the impulse train. So therefore, if you follow this logic, the Fourier transform, this expression here, has to boil down to an impulse train for this to, for this condition here to hold. So by duality, the Fourier transform of an impulse train should actually be an impulse train. OK, so now we're going to check our intuition and actually go ahead and compute this in a more principled way. So let's take a look. So let's say that we have some function that is periodic with period t. And this function is going to be, because of the check your understanding question, I've asked you to compute the Fourier transform of a delta function with period t. So this function is a delta function. And please note, just emphasis, this is periodic. This is not your standard delta function. When I have a subscript here, that means it's an impulse train. So now if I have this impulse train, it's periodic. So I cannot take a clean Fourier transform. All right, so first I need to go and just like before, I have f of t, it's periodic, so I need to go convert it to Fourier series, and then I can look at maybe taking a Fourier transform. So let's start with converting it to Fourier series. First thing I might do, let's find the Fourier series coefficients. So I have ck, and ck equals 1 over t times the integral of minus t over 2 to t over 2, right? It, ck is taken over a period. And it's going to be that function f of t, which is delta of t of t e to the minus j 2 pi over t kt dt. All right, this is just a standard uh, Fourier series coefficient. I've just replaced omega naught with 2 pi over t directly. All right. So now I can actually simplify this, right? If this is taken over one period, then what I can actually write is this. So 
So in this particular case, I've used red just to really emphasize that this impulse train has now been converted to a regular plain old delta. Why is that? Because I'm integrating over a period. Over one period, uh, there's only one delta in this particular case, right? I'm, I only have the regular delta that's here because I'm integrating over one period. Now, because it's a regular delta, the regular delta has support or non-zero values only when t is zero. So if t is zero, the complex exponential just becomes e to the zero, which is one. So now I basically have this integral dt. And remember that the integral of a delta function is nothing but one. So I end up with one over t as being my representation for ck. So ck equals one over t. Now, in this particular case, what we actually have is we know that if we remember from the previous example of the square wave, what happens is that the CK is repeated, right? I have C, C0, C1, C2, and so on. So let me plot that. So here you might have your usual axis like k omega naught. And so here I have C naught. I'll use red. So here's C naught. So C naught is one over t, all right? So let's set k to one. What is C sub one? Well, CK is independent of k. So this is also one over t. Okay, C two one over t. So all the Fourier series coefficients are one over t. So now if we look at our block diagram in the top right, we went from f of t, which was an impulse, and now we went impulse train. So we had this, this impulse train, you know, delta of t. And now we have another impulse train, uh, delta of, I'll just put, it's, it's some other impulse train. So I'll just use the word impulse train here. So impulse train, impulse train. And now we're gonna take the Fourier transform of the Fourier series. So we're gonna take the Fourier transform of the Fourier series. Ft of the Fourier series. So I'm gonna be taking the Fourier transform of this quantity right here. So let's take a look. Remember that in this particular case, delta of t, the original function, is going to be equal to the sum over k of ck e to the j 2 pi over capital T k lowercase t. And this can be simplified because I know what ck is. ck is 1 over t, as we've calculated sum over k e to the j 2 pi over t kt right so all this is in the exponent now what i might want to do is i might want to take the fourier transform of this so i want to take the fourier transform of the fourier series representation fourier transform of, and that equals one over t sum over all k. Thanks to our friend linearity, we can put f inside here e to the j two pi over t k t. Now this actually gets simplified, right? Because we actually know, we know what the Fourier transform of this is. So this gets simplified to one over t, sum over k, two pi delta of omega minus k omega naught. Once again, remember that omega naught equals two pi over t. 
in this particular case, this equals, I'm just going to use the notation that we had about the impulse train. So rather than writing this as a summation, I can move the 2 pi over t outside. So this equals 2 pi over t times a delta. And it's spaced apart by omega naught. So it's going to be delta of omega naught omega. And I'm just going to substitute instead of 2 pi over t, just to make it more compact, I'll use omega naught here. So therefore, in summary, delta of t of t, the impulse train is going to have a Fourier transform representation of another impulse train that has been scaled by omega naught. Right? It's been scaled by omega naught, and it also has a spacing or period of omega naught. It has a period in the frequency domain of omega naught, meaning that each spike is spaced apart by omega naught units. So let's box this and just note that this is now added to the catalog of Fourier transform pairs. Right, so now we have this in the catalog. All right, so what can the impulse train be used for? Well, one of the things we can use the impulse train for is to sample signals. So let's say we have some signal f of t, and we go ahead and multiply it by uh, an impulse train. So if we multiply it by an impulse train, that's just f of t times delta of t of t, right? But we can also expand that because we know what the definition, so this guy here, right, we know that this expands out to the summation. And that's great. So now we have this representation. So if I want to go one layer deeper here, I notice that I can actually, without penalty, go ahead and move f of t in the summation if I want to, right? f of t is not dependent on k, so I'm perfectly within my rights to go ahead and move it into the summation. Now, in this particular case, I can use the sifting property of delta functions to further simplify this. As follows. And so here, what we see is that I am actually sampling the function f at units of kt. The only parts of f that I'm considering are parts of f that are sampled at t units apart, capital T seconds apart. And remember, that was exactly what I wanted to do. So I have a time domain signal here. I have some function. I want to sample it at 0t, 1t, 2t, and so on, right? 3t and so on. And so this impulse train gives me a compact representation to do that. And so here's another plot, a little bit cleaner, of the same thing. Here I have some function, f of t, that's plot along t. I have, I'm going to multiply it right here. This is a multiplication with the impulse train. And what that's going to give me is it's going to give me a sampled representation of f of t that is, of course, equal to what we had written on the previous slide. All right. So now we can revisit our friendly square wave example. So we're going to, again, try to compute the Fourier transform of the square wave. So now remember that the square wave, if I think about it, uh, the square wave itself, let's, not, let's write the expression for a square wave. A square wave here, what is it? Well, let's break it down into its aperiodic portion. The square wave is the rect function right here right here, shown right here. And I'm going to actually uh, use red for this. It's going to be this rect function that is uh, being, we're going to add copies, shifted copies of this rect function. Just like we're adding, have a, a train of deltas, we have a train of rect functions. And that's this 
uh, expression that is shown in this equation right here. It's a train of rec functions. Now, another way to represent a train of rec functions instead of using summation notation is to use our impulse train notation. You take the rect and then you convolve it with the impulse train. Uh, and here, you're going to space the impulse train two seconds apart or two units apart. Why? Because if you look at the delta train, this edge is all two units apart. So the period is two units. So therefore, you're going to convolve it with delta of two. So hopefully, this is clear that now you have this compact representation for the square wave as being rect convolved with delta. And so if you're following up until here, now what we can do is we can simply apply the convolution theorem, right? The convolution theorem tells us, oops, the convolution theorem tells us that capital F of j omega is going to be equal to the Fourier transform of the rect multiplied by the Fourier transform of the impulse train spaced apart by two units. Right, convolution here in the time domain is going to be multiplication in the frequency domain. So I have multiplication in the frequency domain. I have this representation for the Fourier transform. Now, if I want to compute the Fourier transform of the square wave, all I need to do is simply plug in my Fourier transforms that I know. So for example, I know what the Fourier transform of the rect is. It's right here. And I know what the Fourier transform of the impulse train is, because now that's in the catalog, right? Uh, the impulse train's Fourier transform is now in the catalog. So our catalog allows us to go and simply plug in uh, these representations here. So let's do that. So here you have the Fourier transform of the square wave. Well, first step is I'm going to write the square wave in terms. I'm going to write the square wave shown right here as rect convolved with impulse train. So convolution in time, multiplication in frequency, that gets us here. And then you just appeal to the catalog, because now we have a Fourier transform of two elementary functions. And the catalog gets us here. So this is sampling as multiplication with impulse train. Let me not call it sampling. Let me call it representation. of f of t using delta sub t. Then convolution theorem gets us here. And then finally, catalog. So this is one way if you are asked to compute a periodic uh, signal, the, the Fourier transform of a periodic signal, this is one way that you can do it. First, represent your periodic function using a delta train. Then apply the convolution theorem. And then look at your catalog. Either that or do an exclusive Fourier transform if the functions are not in the catalog. And this will give you the same result as what we calculated earlier using the Fourier series of the square wave. All right, so moving on, one intuition to remember here is that the Fourier transform of a periodic signal is the Fourier transform of one period of the signal sampled by an impulse train at multiples of omega naught. If we look here, uh, in the square wave, it's really a sink. It's the Fourier transform, like, so, so here's our square wave, right? And one shorthand to sort of look at this, let me just draw it a little bit neater. So you take one portion here of your square wave, one period, and cover up the other parts for the moment. Now, you take the Fourier transform of this one portion, and then that's a sink, right? Because it's boxcar, so Fourier transform is a sink. And now you convolve, and now you multiply the sink with an impulse train. And that gives you the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of a periodic wave is the Fourier transform of the aperiodic part that's been sampled in the frequency domain by an impulse train.
I know that was a mouthful, so we'll go through it a few times in the rest of the lecture. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, if I look at my square wave once again, here's our friendly square wave. The Fourier transform of one period is a sinc function. So let's put a sinc function here, right? That's shown here in black. Black. Now, when I have a periodic signal, if if this was if all of this was zero, if all of this was zero and there was no other periodicity, then that would be the end of the story, right? If it was just this, and I had my rect, if it was something like this, that's the end of the story. It's just this black sinc function. But the problem here is that I have other square waves here. And so now this black function no longer represents the Fourier transform. In fact, it's a very closely related Fourier transform. It's now the black function multiplied by the impulse train. All right. So let's actually leverage our colors here. So here's F1. F1 would have been the Fourier transform of this guy, right? Your friendly rec function. But now what happens is I tell you that the rec function is actually periodic, all right? So now what you have to consider is that the Fourier transform of the red stuff the fully red function is now actually the original Fourier transform multiplied by an impulse train and scaled by omega naught. So this is a really cool result. What it's telling us is that if I want to take the Fourier transform of a periodic function, I can just find like the aperiodic part. I can find one period of that function, take the Fourier transform as if it was aperiodic, and then go and cascade that, uh, and, and then go and sample that in the frequency domain. So that's what I, that's exactly what I do, right? First step is I take, here I'm outlining the sink, I'm taking the Fourier transform of that one aperiodic component, but the story doesn't end here because it's periodic. So then I go and multiply this in the frequency domain by whatever sampling I need. Okay. So in general, uh, we often use this tilde notation shown right here. There's a tilde here. So F tilde of T to denote the sampled version of some continuous function F of T. So for example, um, if I have a tilde on F of T, then likewise, I would have a tilde on the Fourier transform. This is the sampled Fourier transform. It's the Fourier transform of the sampled function, right? These two are pairs. Now, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, the sampled Fourier transform uh, is equal to, if I just simplify here, it's equal to one over two pi times the Fourier transform of f of t convolved with the Fourier transform of delta t of t, which equals Convolution, convolution. All right. So remember always that omega naught equals two pi over t. All right, so what am I saying here? So what I'm saying is that the Fourier transform is if, so this, this is a different example here, right? This is saying that now I have, instead of a periodic signal, I have a sampled signal, right, F tilde. 
So what I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you, so the previous slides pertain to taking the Fourier transform of a periodic signal. Now I'm going to ask you to take the Fourier transform of a sampled signal. And what we'll see in this lecture is that sampling and periodicity are kind of like duals. Okay, so let's go through line by line what's happening. The first thing I did here was I have to represent my sampled signal with a tilde. The sampled signal has a Fourier transform shown right here. Now that Fourier transform, uh, if I just simplify using convolution theorem, it's the original signal, not the, not the discrete signal, not the sampled signal. It's the original Fourier transform that's now convolved with an impulse train in the frequency domain. What does this mean? This means that, and here I'm going to draw a box. If I have a sampled signal, well, actually, let's say I have an ordinary signal. And let's consider a specific case. Let's say uh, f of t equals the sink. The Fourier transform of sink is a triangle. Okay. Then Right, this is just from the catalog. So let's actually draw that out. So in this particular case, I might have some axis. This axis is, you know, in the frequency domain. So the Fourier transform is a triangle. So let's use red here for this. There you go. That's the end of story. But if I have a sampled Fourier transform, which we're going to write in blue here, okay. if I have f tilde of t equals a sampled version of sinc squared, so it could be sinc squared times an impulse train then the Fourier transform is a little different. It's the same axis, and I still have a triangle here, okay. but I have copies of the triangle because I have to go, I'm multiplying in time, which is convolution and frequency. Fourier transform of impulse train is impulse train, so now I'm convolving the or regular Fourier transform in red, with an impulse train in the frequency domain. So I actually have this replicated sequence ad nauseum to infinity of impulse trains. So this one is, at, is centered around zero. This one is centered around omega naught, okay? This is at minus omega naught. There's another one at minus two omega naught, and so on. All right. So I've got a bunch of these. Uh, so the Fourier transform of a sampled, so here's the sampled, is the regular, is the replicated version. So this is the regular FT replicated by convolving with delta train, right? Delta train or impulse train. And of course, just going through it one more time, we can see this explicitly. This is convolution. All I've done is I've uh, put in the summation notation instead of using uh, delta sub omega naught. And what I can do here is if I just look at this uh, property, 
right? This is just a convolution. I can do my pick and place convolution to see that this is nothing but All right. So here's the duality that uh, is the take home point. If you have a signal that is periodic in time, then it is discrete in spectrum. So this was the first portion of the lecture. Of lecture. And we went through two examples, the square wave and the, and the uh, delta function. On the other hand, there's a duality. This statement can be exactly reversed. So if you have a signal that is now discrete in time, then it's periodic in spectrum. So this is the second segment that we've discussed thus far. And examples that we went through were e.g. square wave, and here we went through uh, the sink squared example, a sink squared that has been sampled. So we're going to peel the onion a little bit deeper on this duality. So let's start with an applied problem. We have some signal f of t, and we need to store this signal. Uh, we have some capture or experimental setup that can sample the signal at every interval t. How do we set t properly that we can faithfully restore the function? If t is too large, you know, we might lose information about the original signal. If t is too small, we waste memory. So let me draw an example. Let's say we have a signal. Okay. And the signal happens to be a sine wave. Now, if t is, this is a very simple signal, but if t is really large here, I'm going to sample, let's say the sine wave is, let's just put concrete numbers on it. Let's say the sine wave is oscillating at one hertz. And I'm going to sample every five hertz. I'm going to sample every five hertz. So I'm going to sample, I'm approximately here, right? This is actually four hertz. So I need to draw one more extension to this. So I'm going to sample every five hertz, let's say. So what that means is I'm going to get, if I look at the discrete version that's been sampled, I'm going to end up with a bunch of essentially these peaks. All right. Now, pretty much any function could fit this. I could use a very, very high frequency sinusoid to fit this, these few points. I could also use, um, for example, a medium frequency sine wave. All right. This also fits. So the point is that multiple sinusoids, uh, some at lower frequencies, will fit this. Right? I could use, for example, um, so I'm sampling every five seconds, right? So in those five seconds, I could have almost any number of sinusoids fit the signal. So what this is saying is that from this right-hand side, which is the samples, I cannot go and tell you that this was a one hertz sinusoid. Okay, I cannot tell you that it was a one hertz sinusoid. And so uh, one of the fundamental theorems of this class, and it will be covered in more detail later, is there's a rule for any signal in the world, it doesn't need to be sinusoid, if it's in the analog domain here, I can tell you exactly how to sample any signal that's analog 
Doesn't matter what it is, as long as it has uh, a frequency bandwidth, as we'll talk about, doesn't matter what it is, it could be any you know signal like this, I can tell you exactly how many samples you need to take in order to recover all these points with mathematical exactness. And that is the sampling theorem, and it's a very important theorem in this class. So here's an example returning to our sinusoids, drawn a little bit better. So here I have um, the same sine wave that's been sampled multiple times uh, at different sampling rates. So these are different sampling rates. And so this raises the question of how many samples do I need to recover the sinusoid, right? It seems like I can recover the sinusoid here. Maybe I can do that. So then why take 10x samples, right? Have, have this sampling rate. So in this particular case, uh, this signal is a cosine of 2 pi t. It's got, therefore, an omega of 2 pi. It's got a frequency of 1 hertz. Now, there's a quantity known as something called bandwidth. Bandwidth is a new definition, is defined as the max frequency of a signal. So in this particular case, B equals one hertz because that's the maximum frequency that's in this. It's just one tone. If I had an orchestra playing, the bandwidth of that would be the highest frequency of the orchestra. Okay. All right, so my light has gone off. Okay. So bandwidth is the maximum frequency of your signal. So defined as such, now we can rewrite my sample representation in the Fourier domain, right? So my sample spectrum here, F tilde, is we know it's going to be shifted copies of regular F, regular capital F. So here's an example of regular capital F, right? Regular capital F. So regular capital F is shown right here. Now regular capital F has a maximum frequency. This is the highest frequency right here is the highest frequency. And that highest frequency occurs at some bandwidth B Hertz, capital B Hertz. And if it's B Hertz, it's two pi B in angular frequency. Now, remember that this is my regular Fourier transform. So, so regular Fourier transform. Regular signal, meaning the continuous signal. Now I'm going to consider two cases. I'm going to consider case one, we sample f of t with large t. That means that every sample of the function in the time domain is very far apart, capital T units. So in this particular case, if I look at my representation for F tilde, capital F tilde, it's copies of regular F that are spaced apart by K omega naught units. They're spaced apart by omega naught. Omega naught equals two pi over T. And so if T is large, then omega naught Uh, so let's, let's start with an example of small t, just to make it easier. So we're going to sample with a small t. So in this case, omega naught is large. And so here, I'm going to have a copy of the triangle out here. This is going to be centered at some omega naught. I'm going to have another copy here. So now let's consider, and I'm going to have an infinite number of copies, right? It's not just two copies. Just one fit on the slide. I'm going to consider another case of sampling. Let us sample f of t with large t. 
That's why I want to use a red color. It's not good to sample a signal uh, very coarsely, right? Sampling a signal very coarsely, you'll lose information. So we sample f of t with a large capital T. So if I sample with a large capital T, now omega naught, what happens to omega naught? Omega naught is going to be small. Therefore, you're going to end up with copies like here. Here's the red omega naught minus omega naught. And I'm going to have additional ones, but I'm not going to draw the other ones. The point here is that, and of course, this is to scale. So let's just draw this as an actual triangle. Right, so all of these are the same shape because they're copies. So I have these triangles. And the more coarsely I sample, the closer the, the copies are together. And the better I sample, the further apart the copies are in the frequency domain. So the take home message here is that if t small, which is a good thing, then omega naught is big, which is again a good thing because the copies are far away in the frequency domain. If t is big, then omega naught is small. This is a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing? Because if omega naught gets too small, then you're going to end up with this copy getting too close to the original signal and smearing with it. Okay, it's going to smear with it, as we'll see in future slides. So the sampling theorem, what it tells us is that for a particular choice of omega naught, which we set because we know what the sampling period is, um, if omega naught is sufficiently larger than 2 pi b, remember it has to be 2 pi b, here's 2 pi b, which is the bandwidth, then the spectrum is going to look something like this, where I'm going to have non-overlapping copies. In this particular case, t is sufficiently small, omega naught is sufficiently big, such that these copies are centered at an omega naught that is, let's, an omega naught that is greater than the bandwidth b. So if this is true, and I have these copies in the frequency domain for the sampled signal, remember this is the sampled signal, then all I need to do is do apply a low pass filter to recover the original signal. Right? I only need one of the copies uh, because only one of the copies represents the Fourier transform of the continuous signal. So I simply low pass it to get the Fourier transform of the regular continuous signal, the ordinary Fourier transform, which we I've been writing a little bit in the last few slides in black, so we'll continue that. So the ordinary Fourier transform is simply one of the copies. So all we need to do is simply invert Fourier transform one of the copies, and then we can call it a day. And this will allow us to perfectly recover f of t after sampling. So if we have ideal low-pass filtering, all we need to, need to do is isolate one of the copies, take the inverse Fourier transform. Now, there's a problem, as you have seen. There's no free lunch here. If we start trying to sample less finely, if we increase the time between samples, this means that the copies get closer in the frequency domain. As you'll see, things are kind of in opposite in the, in the time domain and frequency domain. So if we increase the spacing in the time domain between samples, the spacing in the frequency domain between copies gets closer. So this may not be an issue, right? But eventually, these copies slide closer and closer. And here, they're perfectly overlapping with each other, right? There's, there's, no, there's no overlap. They're, they're right, stacked up end to end. So here, in this case, uh, we're still good. We're still good because we can still recover, um, we can still recover this low-pass filter here. But when we get here, you can see that because the copies are smeared together, I don't exactly have a triangle there. So I'm going to have an imperfect signal recovery. So in this particular case, omega naught here is much greater than, so remember, omega naught is the center here. So omega naught is much greater than 4 pi b. In this particular case, which we call the Nyquist frequency, omega is at exactly equal to 4 pi b. 
And finally here, this is not a good case. Omega naught is less than four pi b. So in this particular case, remember omega naught is the center of the triangle, okay? It's not the, um, uh, it's not the edge of the triangle. So it's the center of the triangle. Uh, this should be closer to here. So it's the center of the triangle and Okay, so it's the center of the triangle. And so in this particular case, uh, the bandwidth is still 2 pi b. So there's 2 pi b this way. And there's 2 pi b here. So therefore, omega naught equals 4 pi b. So that's where this comes from. Let me just write this in blue. So here's omega naught. Right, the bandwidth of the signal to get from the origin to the edge of the first copy, the regular copy, is by definition 2 pi b because that's the bandwidth. Since this is symmetric, it takes you another 2 pi b to get to omega naught. And therefore, omega naught equals 4 pi b at this critical, um, at this critical frequency. This is called critical sampling where you've pushed the envelope and you've sampled just as little as you can, such that the copies don't really smear together. So what happens when the copies smear together? Well, what you've done is you've decreased omega naught, uh, which means that your T is too large in the time domain. So no matter what you do with low pass filtering, if you low pass filter here, you're not going to recover the original uh, signal, right? You cannot recover the original spectrum of the continuous signal. And this is called aliasing or aliasing. Um, this is called aliasing because the, the low frequencies of one spectral copy alias masquerade as high frequencies in the earlier spectral copy. So these alias sections here are shown in the red. So to avoid aliasing, we need to sample uh, at this critical rate. And so no aliasing is gonna happen if two pi b is less than omega naught over two. And you can simplify that to essentially say that your, 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 your T, capital T, which is your spacing in time domain between samples, one over T has to be greater than twice the bandwidth. So what is this saying? Well, what it's saying effectively is that as long as then you're good to go. Okay, T has to be smaller. The spacing between samples in the time domain has to be smaller than one over twice the bandwidth. That means if you have a higher frequency signal, the bandwidth is larger, which means the spacing needs to be even finer. Okay. So in this particular case, this should be one over two B. In this particular case, uh, we need to sample at intervals that are less than or equal to T equals one over two B. This sampling rate, so a, a rate is also called a frequency, right? Sampling rate, also frequency. Sampling period. Sampling period at the critical Nyquist frequency is one over two B. Sampling rate equals two B. So twice the bandwidth is the Nyquist rate. It's named after Harry Nyquist. A telegraph engineer who predicted this theorem uh, many, many years uh, earlier from Shannon. It's also called the Shannon sampling theorem or Nyquist-Shannon uh, sampling theorem. So what, what is this saying? Uh, intuitively, if I just connect this to a real world example, if I have an audio file, remember like our ears are sensitive to frequencies up to 20,000 kilohertz. So you'll often see that audio files, uh, especially back in the day, they used to on video like VLC or media players like QuickTime and so on, they would actually put the sampling rate that a song was sampled at, and they would actually sample this at 
somewhat above 40,000 kilohertz so that you can perfectly recover uh, the song. Okay. So now you may be asking, well, okay, so you've told us that if the spacing between samples is close enough, and Harry Nyquist and the Nyquist theorem tells us what close enough means, then we can recover the signal. Well, how exactly do we do that? So for example, if I have a signal here in the time domain, and I don't exactly know what the signal is, but let's say it's some sort of staircase. and just repeats like that. And I'm gonna sample it here, 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 and here. Let's say that I sample it. Now, if I've sampled it properly, uh, the question is how do I go from the black samples to the red signal that I don't know? Well, if I think about it, we said that all we need to do is we need to low pass filter our samples. So low pass filter in the frequency domain is multiplying the Fourier transform of the discrete black stuff. By the discrete black samples, they're, they're discontinuous, right? They have gaps in the time domain, T, and therefore the Fourier transform is gonna be replicated. So we need to only pick one of those Fourier transforms. So we need to multiply the spectra of the black signal, the Fourier transform, by a brick wall filter, which is just a rect, a single rect. Well, multiplication in the frequency domain by a rect is convolution in the time domain with a Dirac, uh, with, a, with a sink. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually go ahead and I'm gonna multiply, uh, I'm gonna convolve this, uh, sort of sampled version with a sync, and I'm actually gonna get back exactly the ground truth signal that I wanted to get. All right, so I'll get back some representation that, that looks something like the signal that I drew. So this is called sync interpolation. Uh, when we have a sampled signal, as long as we have properly sampled it, right, so that the low pass filtering works, so there's no aliasing, then if we have sampled it at the Nyquist rate, all we need to do is, here's my dis the Fourier transform of my sampled version, it's, it has these copies. All I need to do is I need to low pass filter it. Low pass filter is convolution with a sink in the time domain, and therefore you get this spectrum here. So our low pass filter, has a frequency response of a rect, again, that's, that's capital H, which is a, um, a sink in the time domain. Okay, so this is just sync interpolation and some mathematics of sync interpolation. You can review this on your own time, but basically it's saying exactly what I spoke about before. To reconstruct the continuous version f of t from the sampled version, all we do is we convolve the sampled version here. So we're gonna convolve the sampled version with the impulse response of a brick wall filter. The impulse response of a low pass brick wall filter is a sink. And so if I plug in a sink for this, this is the expression I get for the reconstruction. So this, uh, formula is called the Whitaker Shannon interpolation formula. And so you should be able to go from now discrete samples of a signal to continuous signals. Intuitively, what you're doing in this formula, so once again, here's the formula. Uh, beyond the low pass filtering effect, what you're doing is you're going from these samples shown as red arrows and you're picking and placing a sink at each sample and you're adding up the result. So you're, you're pick and place a, a sink at each of these samples that's shown in green, add up all the sinks together, and that gives you the red function. This is pretty remarkable because it tells you that 
as long for any function in the world that exists, as long as you sample at twice the maximum frequency component of that function, then I can add up sinks to get back the full signal. So if I go back to my orchestra recording that we often go back to, that signal, when I sample it digitally, it has these samples that are spaced apart, right? It has gaps in the recording. As long as those gaps are small enough, such that the highest frequency soprano or flute or pick the highest frequency instrument in the orchestra is, uh, as long as the, the, the sampling period is such that uh, if I pick that highest frequency flute, that, that flute is going to define B. Let's say the flute is the highest pitched thing in the orchestra. If my sampling period T, or equivalently, my sampling frequency is twice the sample of the, the frequency of the flute, then I can exactly add up these sinks to recover the continuous analog signal of the orchestra from a sparse digital recording that's stored. And so this lecture is what's really powered the digital revolution. Uh, I almost have to apologize that we have to do it remotely because this is such a magical lecture uh, to do in person. It's a really, really important lecture that allows you to go from uh, digital electronics to analog electronics and vice versa and tells you when there's a um, there's an equivalence class between them. Okay, so let's uh, apply some concepts of this lecture to one of the homework questions. So uh, by design, what we do in the homeworks is the first few questions you can tackle based on earlier lectures, and the last few, sometimes it helps to watch this lecture. And so those of you who are working on the homework, hopefully you finished the first portion of the homework, and now it's just a matter of finishing 4B in question five. So let's go to question 5A.1. So let's say that X is some band-limited signal. What does it mean that it's band-limited? That means that in the frequency domain by FJW, it has a zero. Okay, this is a band-limited signal. A non-band-limited signal is like this Gaussian. Okay, or maybe this, 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 this Dirac here, the Fourier transform of a Dirac. The Fourier transform of a Dirac doesn't have a bandwidth to it. It has infinite bandwidth, right? There's, it has infinite support. So we're looking for that the highest frequency here. The highest frequency of, a, of the Fourier transform of a Dirac is infinity. The highest frequency of this signal is some number B. Okay, so I have a, this is B hertz, right? So let's say I have a uh, band-limited signal uh, where capital X is non-zero for some, you know, within some bandwidth. Now, if I have the Nyquist rate of the signal, I know that if, in this particular case, that if my signal has a maximum frequency of 2 pi b radians, then I need to sample this at 4 pi b radians for the Nyquist rate. So the Nyquist rate of x of t is 4 pi b or equivalently 2 b hertz, right? So that's the Nyquist rate of the signal x of t. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a modification to the signal x of t. And I'm going to ask you if this modification changes the Nyquist rate for the signal. Do I need to change my sampling spacing to reconstruct the original signal? So in this particular case, we have some x equals x of t plus 1 right? So I'm going to shift the signal. Now let, let us suppose that let's define x1 to be the shifted version. Our goal is to relate the bandwidth b of x1 with the bandwidth b of x, which we had defined as B, simply B. Okay. Now it turns out that if I shift the signal in the time domain, 
the Fourier transform of x1 is simply e to the j omega times the Fourier transform of x. And so what this means is that multiplication of x of omega with the complex exponential does not change the bandwidth of x of omega. So this So this multiplication does not change it. So therefore, this has the same bandwidth. If this has the same bandwidth, it has the same Nyquist frequency because Nyquist frequency is only a property of the bandwidth. So this one also has a bandwidth of 2b. So therefore, the Nyquist rate, uh, the answer to this question is simply 2b. OK. So that was a little bit of a long lecture, but thanks for your attention and see you next time.